Hello and welcome to the newest episode of the Build Shop Podcast. I am one half of the hosting crew, Ryan Brath. I'd like to welcome my co-host to the show, Mike. How are we doing? RB, I'm good. Yourself? Doing good. Doing good. You know, back back from like a little bit of vacation, took some time off. Uh, you know, got a little bit of golfing. I know we're gonna we're gonna touch on that because pace of play is our our main topic today. But before we get to that, I, I got to ask because I know I had a chance to watch some of it uh, over the last little bit, and that is Olympic men's golf. You yeah. know, we, we uh, Xander Shoffley won the gold. What What did you think of that? Like, what did you think of the whole like experience? Was it kind of what you expected from last time, or did you like, enjoy it more so? Uh, I, I enjoyed it. It's nice to see golf in the Olympics. I, I think, um, you know, I kind of almost wish Golf Channel would pick up the coverage um, of, of the golf on Sunday, mine got cut out the last couple holes and it was, I don't know, water pull or something like that. (laughs) Um, so I had to scramble to find the last, uh, the last couple holes, which I I chatted to some guys playing golf this week and they were saying the same thing. So I wish the coverage was a little bit better. Um, and I wish the format, I I mean, they need to see some team aspect to it. Um, you know, I think, I don't know if they still play it, but there was the, world championship golf something. And it used to be played in Australia and it would be like two guys from Canada, two guys from Australia, all different countries. Oh, the old world um, cup. Yeah. That was a great event. Yeah. Right? Um, and that, and that's how I, I almost feel like it should be, but then it's obviously tough to give two gold medals and two bronze and two silver, but there needs to be some type of different format. Cause it's a bit, it's a bit different. Um, but no, it was good. It's nice to see golf in the Olympics and excited for, uh, excited for the ladies golf, which, uh, which already started. So, um, yeah, Olympic Olympic sports is uh, it's always interesting. I, I certainly agree with the idea, and I know we talked about it on previous episodes. Is there, there? I think there needs to be some type of team element. And the other thing too, which I saw on Twitter and I've heard from other people on other podcasts, was about the idea of like the team competition, but also like mixed format. Like, mm. there's nothing wrong with having, say, a 72 stroke put, like 72 holes. And just like, kind of like swimming, right? Like you think of swimming, like swimmers can compete in a number of different styles and lengths and same with runners and golf kind of ha- and there's different types of beach volleyball and you have different teams in different countries. So you could have a mixed event. Like there's mixed relay and swimming now, which I don't think I'd recall happening before in other Olympics. And you could do alternate shot. You could do, um, you know, better ball or best ball, however, whatever kind of format you refer to it as and have those throughout the week. Now I would take a bigger chunk out of professional golf schedule, but they got four years. I think there's a way that they could figure it out, but overall I thought it was really neat. And I thought the other part was, you know, when we watch week to week on the PGA tour or the LPGA tour, which is going to be curious to see how this goes this, this coming week with the, the tournament is the, like if a player, if five players tie for third, they just split the money. They split the point, the FedEx cup points and boom. No, I was, I was very curious about this after like the second round. And then I realized seven way playoff for bronze. How Crazy. sick was that? That was nuts. Yeah. So that's, I think that's the part that cut out at one point was a seven way playoff. So it was tough to find that kind of footage, but um, yeah, it's smart. That's how it, that's how it should be. No, no splitting. I mean, I know there was, I don't know if they were runners or hurdles or whatever. They split the gold medal or two gold medals. Oh, the high jumpers. Yeah. Yeah. The high jumpers. I, uh, you know, you know, you, you know, you're, you're not playing to have fun. You're playing there to win. And I know that's the old Timbits hockey slogan. You're <laughs> there to have fun, but you know, second place is the first loser. And you know, you, you still want to, you still want to win. All those athletes are there to win gold um, and try their hardest. So um, yeah, the playoff was, the playoff was cool. And I just, I thought like, it was so fascinating because I was asking, I mean, I was sitting there with my wife for we watching it after the second or third round. And I thought, wait, they're not going to give out seven, like two silvers or three silvers. And do they just cut off bronze if two people are tied? Like, well, how does this work? Yeah. And yeah, I thought, I thought it was fascinating to see that. And I think it does lend, lend itself to some excitement that you don't get. Like you think about what a medal is valued at to like an individual athlete, right? Like there is still value in third place. There is value in bronze to that person who gets to stand on that podium. And from, that's, from that's cool. Other countries. I mean, second, second and third place is, is a lot of money. I mean, you know, I, I saw in the Philippines, I don't remember what sport it was, but if it was first, second or third, it was like 600,000 us dollars, 400,000 us dollars and like 200,000 us dollars. And like, 
you know, with that girl, that heavy weight lifter, whatever you want to call her from the Philippines, like she got two houses and like $800,000 or something like that. Like it's a game changer for those, the U S and I don't know how much Canadian athletes get, but I think it was a TikTok and the American athlete was like, we get $8,000 for third place. And obviously it's, you know, the countries are different. Like a lot of these athletes, that's their training to live. And, you know, I know, I know all athletes are the same level, but different countries just have different perks, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy. I didn't realize they, uh, they made money from that, but then again, it makes, it makes sense. Yeah. And that's, that's on top of like, depending on what sport they're in the um, uh, like the endorsements that come along with that. Right. Like that's, that's the really cool thing is like, you know, you got Haley Wickenheiser who's still doing commercials and stuff like that. Who's like a female hockey player in Canada. You've got, I don't, I don't know how the monetization of Justin Rose winning, but I mean, he won a gold medal. He got a new equipment sponsor. It's like, there's a lot of money to change hands, right? I am Morgan Stanley. Like all these. Look at, uh, look at Penny, you know, how how much, how much endorsements is she going to get the minute she lands in back in Canada? I mean, it'll be, it'll be absolutely insane. She'll make huge money from that. She'll write a book. She'll do this, this and that, and she'll be loaded to the gills. So I know, I think it's, it is cool. And I, and you know, these people, they do work there like very, very hard in all of their athletic, athletic endeavors. So I think it's, it's something that's, that's always cool to watch. And you know, it, it, we always, we're, we're golf nuts. We always, we want more golf as, as much as we can, but it is, it is a global thing. And it was also cool to see Rory kind of change his opinion a little bit on the golf and be able to do that. So, you know, I think, uh, I think the next Olympics, for golf, which I would imagine is, I think is in Paris. Um, hearing like Rory's feedback and JT's feedback. Um, the guys are excited about it. Um, you know, the guys are talking about like, you know, should this be as the same praise as a, as a major and, and having those guys say that stuff, it's only got to put fire under DJ's ass. And, you know, Tiger's got to be sitting at home with his feet up right now going, damn, I need a, an Olympic medal. I mean, it's, it's stuff that other golfers don't have. So I think with those boys changing their tune on it, it will be, it'll be even a bigger part of the Olympics in four years time. Yeah. And I know we saw, I'm like, I've always been like a skateboarding nut and to see like, you know, Tony Hawk was there just representing and kind of showcasing and do, I think he was doing some broadcasting as well and seeing those people like having, seeing it become an, an Olympic sport when it was like a thing of, obviously very different side of very, very contrasting to golf, but still like you got young kids who are there, like the 13 year old uh, girl who won golden like street skating. Like that's insane. She's younger yeah. than the person you, she's younger than the official rules to compete in like the junior Olympics, which is like 14 to 18. Like, it just, right. It's it's cool to see the, like what this leads to down the road and uh, congratulations to all those who obviously meddled and played well. Um, now the main topic of today's show, and this was a, a discussion that, uh, started with, I will uh, happily call it a Twitter rant after something that happened the other day, and that is pace of play. Now, I'm not referring to professional golf. You know, professional golf lives in a different world. We, could, we would all love to see it move a little faster, but in a lot of cases, you know, it is what it is, and I'm not here to moan about that. Although, you know, I've watched tournaments and, and you know, been very annoyed by the pace of play on both the LPGA Tour and the PGA Tour in many cases, in many instances but we're sticking to public recreational out in the wilderness with all the other golfers pace of play. And first question to you, Mike, what is your ideal round of golf? If you were going to play 18 holes with say two to four people, what is your personal expectation of a round of golf and how long that should take? I mean, depending on, depending on the golf course, I mean, at my home club, no, no more than 345. anything over 345, and you've been out there, for too long. And that's not, that's not rushing around. That's not, not raking bunkers or taking the flags out now, which is, is different. Um, you know, all of us are a range of, you know, scratch handicap to, you know, I play with up to guys who are 15 handicaps, um, who are all good friends of mine and everyone's kind of down the middle. If we're looking for a ball, it doesn't take, you know, we don't take too long. Like the the, you know, the legal five minutes or two minutes, whatever it is. <laughs> um, you know, we play our OB and our red stake, the, you know, just very basic. If you got to drop one at the end of the day, we're not playing a PJ tour event and we're not, you know, we're not trying to shoot a course record. Don't get me wrong. We're all out there with 
specific goals. I want to go out and, you know, I've got a number in my head that I'd like to beat from the previous week and um, make a, one less double, um, you know, and, and it's, it's definitely your grinding, but, you know, we, you know, I walk ahead of guys, they walk ahead of me. We know we're not going to kill them. We're not going to, you know, nine times out of 10, not going to shank it. Um, so yeah, honestly at my club, three forty five. anything over than that, you're, something's gone wrong or you'll, you'll know you're slow because people will be right up your butt um, or they'll just walk through you. Um, and that's kind of the, I guess the tradition at our club is known to be notoriously fast. Um, but it, it was interesting. Your tweet last night, and I don't want to jump the the conversation, but I, I respected it because, of, uh, and it got me thinking, I was like, man, like public golf is always slow. Public golf is always slow. There's private clubs in the city that are, notoriously slow, like 445, 510. I mean, I love golf, but I cannot be outside for five hours and 10 minutes. It is way too long. I don't care if you've paid. I, listen, I've heard rumors that a round of golf at Pebble Beach high season is close to seven hours. I'm supposed to be in Pebble Beach next year. My dad hates slow golf. So he'll either have to be high or drunk to play that round of golf. <laughs> he will go absolutely ballistic. But you know, again, yeah, you know you're going to be in California, Mike. There's going to be a lot of nice wine around there. You know, it's always hard yeah, to get one of those the, in the golf yeah, bag. But. That's the end of the trip. That's the end of the trip. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's one of those. It's not just public golf. Um, it just, you got to, you got to pick your spots and your times of when is good for you to play golf. And I played a municipal golf course last week. I don't even know if it's a muni, but I played up a, a public golf course and we played in four hours on the dot and we weren't waiting. No one was waiting behind us. Um, I mean, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have, well, I, ha I don't have the answer for how to pick up pace of play, just ideas of how to pick up pace of play. Yeah. And I think, for me, my idea is like if I'm playing with four people and it's on a busy golf course, like I understand like it's very different from, you know, uh, to uh, an open golf course where you tee off very early and all those kind of things. But to me, like the four hour mark is like, like my cutoff. And to your point, like I remember being uh, a kid and being playing at like my local golf course, which is like this little semi-private course and the club championships would take like five and a half hours for round of golf. I'm like, no, like, let me tell you people, if you're a 15 handicap taking five and a half hours versus four hours, you're not going to be shooting any different. Like in reality, like you're grinding over putts and this really applies to everybody. And I know for myself, my score doesn't change too much. If I'm like really, maybe, maybe we're looking at one or two strokes over, you know, 18 holes, but in general, your score is not going to fluctuate that much because you're playing to your handicap and you're playing the same course or whatever it happens to be fast as you are slow. So that's one for me and where this all stemmed from. And again, you referenced the tweet that I, I put out yesterday uh, evening because I had gone out to, well, there, I got a couple of problems, but I'll stick with the slow play thing this evening. But I, I booked the time, went to go out and play, got paired up with other people and that, and that part was fine. But there was a group of three three people in front of two other groups, and they were obviously like newer golfers. And I'm not crapping on new golfers. This has nothing to do with it, and it doesn't have anything to do with handicap either. Because to your point, my dad is a 15 handicap golfer, and if we go out and play together, we are like under three hours walking. And I think we both play from the proper tees. We're not playing 7,200 yard golf courses. It's the idea that you know we'll have maybe we'll have a little conversation on the tee. We'll go to our shots wherever it happens to be, and we are generally farther apart <laughs> all over the golf course. And then we meet up at the green, we play, we walk to the next tee, and we continue that process. Uh, I must heard someone reference it, and it was like a lot of golfers they don't understand that you know you can go to your ball and hit sh hit the shot right. It's just it's the etiquette side of the game, which I know it makes it sound snobby, but it's not to me. It's not snobby. It's like you know. I think of it as I'm an intermediate snowboarder. I don't go that often, but I also don't put myself on the triple black diamond right down the start. I'm going to go to the one that's appropriate to me. It's like going to the right tee deck. And so I played two and a half hours to play eight holes with other people. And I was like, by the end of it, I was just like, I'm done with this. This is terrible. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I had questions come up. So we do have questions that we'll get to from like a club building side of things, but do you think to yourself, like, 
do you think skipping holes is a reasonable thing? Is it, do you think it's rude to do that to like go by somebody or do you just kind of like suck it up and you're like, you're stuck here? Like what would, what would be your normal like pace? Like what would be your process there? I mean, I think playing through is fine. I don't think it's rude. I think there is like a, a dark cloud over people having to ask, Hey, can I play through, you know, or waving up from the T and kind of thing. And um, like I said, uh, it's, it's kind of the way we do things at, at my home club, you know, guys will skip holes. They'll be like, Hey, I'm playing a match or, you know, I'm a twosome. You guys are a four ball. I know I'm going to be stuck behind us, but we're not slow, but you know, he can, he can be done an hour faster than we could obviously go through and, you know, guys skip holes all the time. I don't think it's wrong. I think, you know, it's the, the whole etiquette thing at golf, I don't think has been touched on enough because I think we've tried to make the game acceptable for, for everyone, but we've almost forgot about the rules. Um, and every sport has rules. Everything we do has rules. Um, but if we can make the rules hip or fun or whatever it is that we need to make rules, I think people will appreciate it. I've got new buddies that play golf this year because of COVID and, uh, you know, they were asking me some questions about, you know, his, their first round this year, he's like, you know, uh, he was asking me like, what should I wear? And, um, so I can't remember the other thing he was asking, but it was just stuff that like, yeah, you could Google that stuff. You can look online, but you know, courses should almost in emails, let's talk about public clubs should be able to send this info and say, Hey, here's, here's the top five etiquette rules that we really support here. And it's, it's not that there's an old crotchety man sitting at a clubhouse in St. Andrews pointing at you like the (laughs) Grim Reaper. It's just making it, making etiquette more of a, something that everyone wants to do rather than feel like it's a, you know, it's an old stodgy kind of thing. But I think the, the etiquette can be, you know, I remember that golf channel uh, ad where it was Palmer and it was, um, it wasn't Arnold Palmer, but it was like, while we're young and it was yeah, talking yeah, about like, yeah, speed yeah. play. I think that's great. It was, it was trying to like, I think put a, like a, a spin on a laugh on like, you know, slow play and stuff. And it, I think that's just great. I haven't seen that commercial in 10 years. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think it's getting people the right tee box, unless you're shooting par from a certain tee box, then move up. Um, and, and just, if you have to play through, play through. I wouldn't say skip a hole. I would say I would rather you play through and don't be nervous that you have to rush to get through it. Um, you know, at least be happy you're playing through. You're not getting stuck behind groups. Yeah, I know uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was about, about a month ago, I was playing with another friend of mine, public golf course, nine hole. It's a nine hole golf course and played the first nine holes in like an hour and 15. Like, again, we're both under like a, under 10 handicaps. I'm just being very like, you know, uh, not generous, but just being kind of like giving an idea, right? We hit our shots, we lose a ball, we drop a ball. Like it's very, you know, we're trying to keep pace, but we're also trying to shoot a certain score. We both played fairly well that day, but we got to the back nine because they started letting other groups off. And that's very understandable because it is only nine holes that, I mean, there were still only like three groups ahead of us. We were very early. We were the first group off and they were looking for golf balls. And I'm not just saying like, Oh, maybe it's over in this area and I'll drop one. It's like, no, like they're in the bushes and all of a sudden we're looking at each other and lucky for us, there's this little loop on the end of the whole course. And we're looking at each other going, are we going to sit here? And I was like, no. So we skipped two holes and kind of played the rest of the, of the way in and just like, you know, just is what it is. But I don't think there is no, there shouldn't be a fear about addressing an an etiquette about time. And I played, I played today uh, and I played and we played on a golf course that was very busy teed off at one o'clock in the afternoon on a busy public golf course. So you can imagine my expectations for the day were going to be slow. You know, they're pairing us up with other groups of people. They're basically everybody out there is a foursome. That's fine. But they told us in the pro shop, they told us on the first tee and every three holes, there was one of those clocks that gives you like the par time, right? Four hours. And I was playing with a friend of mine who's also like a single digit handicap. And we played with two older guys. Uh, my friend, shout out Bruno and Tony. I know you're not listening to this whatsoever, but had a good time. Today. It was a lot of fun. They hit it nowhere off the tee. They were, uh, but they, they were in the leather. They picked it up. They were happy with that. And if they lost a ball, they just drop it. 
Like they go, oh well, I'm not looking. It's fine. And they were pl- and they played quickly, and we kept up to the group in front of us. We stayed in front of the group behind us. And in general, like it was, I was like kind of shocked by the pace, to be honest. And I realized it was because the course has set the expectations for people very, very clearly. And you know, people I've heard, I got, I, I, my, my phone blew up. My phone is still going off from this, like 24 hours later. And people, I've gotten messages like oh, it's, it's bros with beers and all this stuff. And I, and I kind of put myself in the category of easily can have a couple beers on the golf course and play very fast. I can, you know, I can understand if I'm at a club, depending on their pace of play. That's another thing that's very, you know, I understand, like you go into the rules, right? And if, think about it, like there, people are scared to offend the slow group. If you're in a restaurant and, and like one table doesn't like their meal and everyone else in the restaurant likes their meal, they don't change the menu. They just apologize and say, you know, we will, you know, we're sorry you didn't enjoy it, but like, this is, you know, this is our menu. This is what we do. We'll make, you know, obviously going down food allergies and all that stuff. That's not the, that's not the point of the analogy, but if you also rent ice time in an arena, and this is a more of a Canadian reference, but if you rent a court to play basketball or something like that, you can't be like, Oh, you know what? We got five more minutes in our game. We haven't figured out who won. It's like, no, it's, you know, you're done. You rented it for a certain period of time, like get on with it. Right. And I yeah. think it's, it's okay to set that expectation. I've never owned a golf course. I've worked at many golf courses and that has been the expectation that has always set for it where I worked. So when golf courses don't do that and, you know, the customer's always right mentality, you know, sometimes they're not. And it's okay because you're not the only customer in this entire golf course that probably has, you know, how many ever groups of people on it. Right. So I think that overall needs to be addressed. And it is, it's, it's a circle of all kinds of things that we can talk about, but I'm not picking on handicaps. Cause again, I've talked about players that are higher handicaps that play very fast. It's not about, beers or whatever, because I know I did, I played an event at Sweetens Cove a couple of years ago now. And let me tell you, there was a lot of beers consumed by a lot of golfers. A lot of people, we, at the time we, the course was closed, but we were a full group of people and we were playing matches and going around in nine holes, uh, switching up groups because people wanted to play with different people. Hour and a half, nine holes, every single time, everyone got them. Everyone knew the, like what was going on and that's how it happened. So I think basic, it really is an expectation. In basic foursomes, you were playing that? We were playing foursomes. Yeah, we were playing foursomes or match play. It was like two people playing match play in a group. So match play is always faster anyways. But, and that's another issue in North America is like everyone thinks they need to hole out. It's like, look, you've made double par. You've lost two golf balls on this hole. Let's just pick up and go and quit like messing around or mucking around. Um, I, I could I could rant on this for days, Mike, because it is just a pet peeve of mine by, by course operators that don't, kind of follow along and people that don't get it. And I get, I know this again, the pre, like preface this whole thing. I realize it sounds super, super snobby, but if you apply this to any other sport, it's it, you, you can, it's just golf. People don't want to offend people. I don't, I don't understand why. And I think in some cases you have to tell people like, you know, we have an expectation and that's what it is. So um, we'll stop the ranting for now. I know that was a big topic we wanted to talk about. And I think too, like, for us, we play golf courses that are very walkable. I know your club from tee to green is probably pretty short walk. So that helps with those kind of things. And a lot of modern golf courses don't have that, but anyways, we'll get there one day, maybe for some reason, I'll be able to play another public golf course in under, you know, th- three and a half hours, but uh, we're still dreaming, but let's talk about, you know, we are the build shop podcast. And I got some questions for you, Mike. I know you asked someone on uh, Instagram as well. You can follow along. I'm RDS breath on Instagram, Mike, give the people a handle. Mike TXG, simple. It's so simple every time. I mean, you could put it on your t-shirt. You know, we're not, we're in, we're in an audio medium, but you know, that'd be fun to wear around all the time. Um, but I got some good questions this week um, for myself and I'm sure you got some too. But the first one is, and this is, I get it a lot and it's becoming more popular because of the popularity of this type of product. And that is with graphite shafts, because you are the build guy at TXG, Mike, you're, you're the one running the shop back there. With graphite shafts, do you put tungsten powder down them to get them up to swing weight? That was one of the questions I've gotten. It's a common one, and I'm curious what you do. No, and a couple of reasons. One, I just don't like it. Um, yeah, I don't like the the weight above. By the time you cork it and stuff like that, there's just too much weight I find above the ferrule and it doesn't feel right. And that's not where weight's supposed to go. Tip weights for other irons and stuff go right into the hosel, which I like. Um, But tungsten powder, 
I've had to, don't get me wrong. I've had to do it. I've done it on putters and stuff like that to, to achieve certain weights, but I don't love doing it. And you know, if it cut worse comes to worse, we will, we'll try to find another alternative, whether it's, um, you know, you can get tungsten plugs that look like tip weights that slide up through the graphite shaft. I know certain shafts like, uh, what is it? MMT 125. I can't put any tip weight up there. Um, so, you know, generally with that weight, depending on the head it's going into, which is generally a forged blade style is going to be pretty good head weight already. So there's really no manipulation of, of weight needed, but no, I don't like the tungsten stuff. I just, uh, it's just a very unprofessional way of, of doing things. I think if you get the right weight of components, you'll be in a better spot. No need for the tungsten. Yeah. And I think, uh, and we, we talked about it from the tip weight point of view or from the, um, you know, the ping adapter, especially because it does kind of wedge itself in and it's not right. You're actually pushing down on a circle, which is expanding, right? So you, if you're dealing with thin wall of graphite, even if it's thick wall of graphite, you're creating weak spots in there, which, you know, you talked about being above the hosel is a huge issue. I'm okay with it in putters, like steel shafted putters. If someone really yeah. wants this particular putter and wants it to be heavier, I don't think tungsten powder and a cork and a steel shaft is a big deal, but it is a huge no-no in graphite. If you ever talk to a club builder and they'll say, yeah, we'll take these 110 gram graphite shafts and then we'll, we'll put some tungsten powder in it. Uh, that's just run, run the opposite direction because that is not the right way to do it. And the likelihood of something breaking or not feeling good is very high. Um, another one too, and I think we're going to have these on the, on the channel pretty soon is, uh, you know, direct to consumer products, very popular right now. And one of the questions I got was, what do you like? Or should I guess, I guess that was a, that was a leading question. What do you think a new level product? Have you hit it? What do you think of it? Uh, is there a certain product club that you have that you really like? Like, uh, what's your experience with them so far? Yeah, I mean, we've had their product in the in the drawers now since you know day one, a new level, which almost feels like day one for us. Maybe a year after we were in business, so um, it's good. Eric Birch is uh, is a good friend of the company's and knows what he's doing. He's a smart individual. Um, and he's, he's producing great product. It's, you know, the factories that stuff's coming out of is does really good job, high quality. Um, the new irons that just arrived, I'm going to butcher them. I'm pretty sure they're PF one or FP one. PF. I think it's PF. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they look, they look fantastic, but cleaner lines now and stuff like that. So yeah, impressed to, uh, you know, impressed the first looks and excited to, to hit the stuff. I know a couple, a couple lads, um, through customers and stuff that have, have purchased them. They, uh, they love them. the direct to consumer stuff's great for, especially the equipment junkie that just wants to try stuff. Um, you know, he's got a great program. I think it's like a 30 day money back guarantee. Now you have to have a reason why you're sending it back. You can't just buy irons and send them back. You have to have a, a pretty reasonable reason, but his, uh, his direct to consumer line is, is great. And, uh, you know, we, we want to support him as much as we can. And I know that that review is coming in the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I know, um, for myself, I've, I've had the chance to talk to Eric a number of times, uh, on like previous podcasts I hosted and uh, had the chance to actually have a set of the 623 M's, which are an unreal forgiving iron for the, the style of blade that they are. I know that he talks about it and we had Tony Covey on from my golf spy. They've rated well on theirs uh, in the past. It's like they're, um, was it most wanted they call it. So like overall, I think they, they do produce some really good stuff. And for me, the thing that I love about them and a lot of the other direct consumer companies is because they are smaller outfits they also focus very much what we do is on the build, mm -hmm. right? Like fitting the golfer, fitting the customer, whether it be over the phone, like we do with a virtual fit at TXG or something like that, and go through the process of having these conversations to be able to deliver a really quality build at the end of the end of the fit to that, to that golfer. And I think that is one of the biggest differences because very few people are buying something off the rack from them. And I think that's a huge advantage for any consumer out there is you don't have to go into a big box store and just be like, okay, well, this is what I'm going to get because of the price and it's on sale and you can't get it uh, because it's, it's a discontinued model. That's why it's on sale. So we can't order these products, like whatever you're doing stuff after, after the fact it's no, like every single one you're going to get, if you're ordering from them is custom built and custom fit for you. And I think that's, that's one of the coolest things about them. Uh, do you have any questions, Mike? What'd you, what'd you get this week? I got a couple more, but we'll, we'll cycle back and forth here. Yeah, I got a couple. Um, 
what to do, what to do, what to do. Favorite, I got one guy was asking what our favorite OEM is to work with. And I would imagine, obviously, that is to build with. I mean, mine is, mine's pretty easy. They're all, they're all good. But if I can get the heavier headweighted stuff like a Mura or what else is coming heavy right now? Srixon headweights are really good. Um, I, uh, we're working with a set of uh, sevens, a nice M- MB set of sevens. Uh, the pitching wedge is almost too heavy. Um, Mizuno A, B, and C heads are great. Titleist is pr- providing us better head weights. So the OEMs are getting it, which is nice. They're, you know, they're starting to dial in those specs a little bit easier for us. But I would say Mira and Strixon right now are probably, you know, my one and two to, to build with. Yeah, I think it's uh, for us from a building side of things, it's always about the head weight. Yeah. Uh, especially when people like a lot of stuff is short or lighter weight. Uh, so to, to try and balance that out for the player is always like uh, a big one. And, you know, I actually, it's funny. I got a question about mirrors. Like, what do you think about mirrors? What's the, like, why do people always talk about them as being like this, this thing that people want to have. And we've talked about it in the past. I know Ian has mentioned it because he's played sets in the past. I have a set of blades as well is that the head weights are heavier. So there's, mm-hmm. I think there's like a, there's a feel associated with them. Cause a lot of people don't have never had like, heavier golf clubs off the rack kind of thing. Most of them are like kind of the D2 to D0. But a lot of the stuff for mirror is going to end up a little bit heavier. And when you are custom fit and custom built for those and they are a heavier head weight, I think a lot of people actually enjoy that. You know, it sounds silly, but it is like more of a little thuddy sound. And it, it has to do with the geometry of the club heads and all this stuff, right? Yeah, 100%. I think even the uh, the Mira, the Mira 501s that I have, I mean, I've, you know, although they're a blade, but not really a blade, they're more of that muscle back kind of style of iron, not something that maybe I would gravitate towards to use, but obviously love the look of them and, um, you know, offset or no offset, they are, you know, pound for pound, the easiest, you know, quote unquote blade to hit. Um, and, uh, when I first put them in play, they were, my ball striking changed and, you know, some people I played with are like, how the hell and why the hell, but, um, <laughs> I've got, I've got the Strixons in the bag right now. Cause I'm, uh, don't want to change anything in my uh, bag setup, but the mirrors are sitting in the house and I'm like, I need, uh, might go play with them this weekend. Maybe a Sunday bag is needed. So, um, the mirrors for feel wise, yes, there is a, a different feel. Um, I would also take that the longevity of mirrors, um, you know, anywhere from, an MB 001 to the baby blades from 15 years ago to, you know, even CB 301. Now the the quality and the consistency of how long they last and um, you know, plating never really runs away or anything like that. It's um, it's top notch. Yeah. I know um, a lot. There's a, there's a couple of the, the Japanese forging houses, obviously mirrors, the big one that a lot of people recognize Kyoi or Kyoi. Um, I always, I never get the name right. I know I've heard a million. I think it's Kyoi, but Kyoi. Yeah. I don't know either. I've, I've got some stuff that's from there. Like, uh, some Japanese, like a grind, which is a brand, um, I've hit Kyoi stuff in the past, just like their own house brand stuff. And, you know, it's the same process. Like it's literally like yeah. they, they go through the same process for everything they're manufacturing. It's just like different designs, whether it be for a certain company or, or whether it be their own like internal stuff that they do it's all about for them be, because of the head weight thing. And because they're a little heavier and you have that thicker muscle pad, it is a sound thing. It is a sound yeah. for the feel. And also just ease of working with, I think is always for me, it's, it's a huge advantage. Like when I'm building stuff that, you know, doesn't need tip weights as a club builder, I'm just sitting there rubbing my hands together. Like this is sick. It just makes yeah. my job think, so much easier. I think the cool thing with Mira too, is like the whole story of like Mira son and his son, like, you know, the guy is, over 70 now i think maybe he's even in his 80s and you can go on their social media and i don't think it's propaganda like mirror sounds like still sitting like at the chair like grinding away doing final polishes like he he's i think his can't remember the story but his son was saying it was like 10 years before his dad kind of let him let him go and grind away on on his on their own clubs and you know, the factory is the factory is not huge um and they're producing as much as they can that it's you know I think Mira right now is on back order for a couple months just because they they're not producing enough in Japan to to get to the U.S. and then to get to us. So um, the fact that he still has his hands on them is uh, is pretty special. 
Yeah, I think it's, I think that is one of the cool elements of it. Um, now this this goes back to the pace of play one. Uh, I got a question because I know I'm a big fan of them as long as everyone keeps up. Uh, what do you think of like fives and sixes on the golf course? Do you think it's an issue or do you, is it just a matter of keeping up? It's just a matter of keeping up. I mean, last night I played in a in a sixum, but again, my golf course doesn't doesn't exist everywhere else. I mean, literally four o'clock, we were the last group to tee off for the rest of the day. Um, again, we have a lot of cottagers, so they're out of the city. It was a long weekend, but majority of the time, a six sum at night at our club is a no brainer. I mean, it's, it's very easy to do. Um, we played again in like three hours, 36 minutes or something like that in a six sum. So I'm not against it. I think if, if everyone's at the same level or a very common handicap, you know, let's, let's say it's everyone's in a range from five to eight, I think is a good time because people are, they're in this, they're all going to make the same mistakes and some are going to hit it great. And, you know, they're all kind of, it's, they would be tougher if it was like two plus handicaps and then the rest were 20 handicaps. Yeah. That's just, that's just brutal. That can slow down play. But again, we played super quick. Two guys were in a buggy. The rest of us walked. Um, and it's not like we were running out or, you know, not raking or not (laughs) moving the, the pin or something like that. We were, we were taking our time. We were playing little matches, you know, two man team matches. And it was, uh, it was fun. First time actually I've ever played in a, in a six sum. So, um, yeah, I mean, or, or that's a lie. Cause at the PGA show, um, we do eight, we isn't it? eight sums. Yeah. Um, and it was great. It sped it up that we, we play in a, an event called Acre Day and RB you've been in it a bunch of times. Like we've played in, you know, foursomes that take long and then they moved it to eight sums, I think two years ago or whatever. And pace of plays faster. You get to meet new people in the industry, or maybe you're playing with friends from the UK or different parts of the world that you haven't seen. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is doable. It definitely is doable. Again, everyone's similar handicap, some really good players, some mid handicappers, I would say you got to keep the range a little bit smaller. So that doesn't slow you down. And I think that's the reason I think high handicappers get intimidated but I don't really see low hand handicappers like being like rude to high handicappers. If you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I would never, I would never, you know, if you're a high handicap, I, I worked with two guys today that were 20 plus handicaps and they were, they were like, Oh, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. I'm like, listen, pal, I can show you a really shitty swing in 30 seconds. Just give me the club. <laughs> and it, it happens. Like if I could, re- if I could get rid of your miss hits, I'd be able to walk on water. It's impossible. They're going to happen. Let's make your miss hits better. But I, there's no one has the right to make fun of anyone, how they golf, regardless of their level. I get it. People are intimidated, but um, at the end of the day, you're the one that has to hit a golf ball. You're playing for yourself, like in yourself kind of thing. So um, I'm not trying to get too motivational here, but uh, it's uh, yeah, there should be no right for anyone to be calling high handicappers out or anything like that. No. And like, again, I, I always feel like I have to pretense it, but like I play with a lot of higher handicap golfers all the time. And, you know, I think people are always like, think that a high, lower handicap golfer looks down on a higher handicap. I'm like I was, I was, when I was a kid, I used to get dropped up at the golf course and I didn't start as a, you know, five handicap. There was no one does, but I, I would play with random people all the time. I just, I kept up and it was always, everyone was always very encouraging. And when I play with other people, I played uh, last night, even though it was very, very slow. I played with two higher handicap golfers that played from the forward tees, a husband and wife couple. Uh, they were a little bit older and they were great. Like we had a great time. We talked about different things. We talked about, we talked about food. We talked about golf. We talked about the area, we talked about the golf course. And it's, it's like, it's the whole point of it. It's supposed to be a little bit social as well, but you know, there's, there's, um, it really doesn't, it's not about the golfer's skill level. It's just about what you do in between your shots. I think is the big thing. And it's as far as, as like fives and sixes, I've played accurate day. It's awesome. It's busy. It, it is like a, it is a scramble format with the two, like an eight some. So that always makes it really quick. It's a lot of fun. And just overall, I think having more people can, can be a blast when everyone keeps up. And I don't think there's any issue with it at all. And as I said earlier, I talked about that event at Sweetens Cove that I went to. I'd love to do it again. Uh, I know 
Uh, my friend Peter Schmidt runs like one of the guys who runs the eternal summer golf society, which is like persimmon golf. I'm going to do that actually next time I go out and play, I'm going to get out the old persimmons and blades again, but uh, to be able to do that and be able to play quick and be able to play in these big groups and like fly around a golf course is uh, I think it's, it's still something that's very easily attainable when everyone kind of follows kind of along. Um, now I got one for you, Mike, because I think this is, this is one of those questions that we get a lot. I know we're going to do some, some videos on this on the channel and that is understanding grinds. Do you think that for golfers, it's, uh, it's just about under like, you know, being able to self-analyze what you're looking at or, cause I think people get really confused about it, but I think for a lot of times, like, you know, a, a grind, two grinds from certain companies can be very, very similar. They might name them something differently, but it just comes down to, you know, picking ways that you like and, and kind of analyzing what you like as far as the grind is concerned. Because most companies at this point either have a question and answer thing on their site, if you're just buying off the rack, or they, they have very good descriptions to help you self kind of self-assess, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give kudos to the Vokey team and the guys at Titleist because you can go on their website. They've got, call it 15 different grinds or 10 different grinds uh, for, or for multiple bounces and, and loft. And, uh, you've got, you've got more than, you've got more than, you know, the ability to learn as much as you can on grinds, bounces, all that. And it gives you a visual aspect that shows you the wedge, the loft that you like, it highlights it in a light blue. Um, you can then do like a fit yourself for a wedge, read a bit about the grinds and bounces, read kind of folks, you know, notes on, on why he's done that. The info off their website's great. And and then you can, once you kind of, I mean, I'm not going to lie, I've studied their website and try to learn why do they have these grinds and what do these grinds do? And obviously we have access to all these wedges. I can go hit them and take them out on grass and um, and try a bunch of different things. But you know, if you're if you're stuck on, if you're stuck on grind, go to go to Voki.com and um, this is not an ad, by the way, and just uh, do some, do some reading because their website's the most in depth. Yeah, I get I get questions a lot on Instagram about like this this grind versus this grind or what do I need, and that is that really is one of my first resources that I send people to. Uh, I know Cleveland does a good job. They used to do uh, like a they called it the wedge you could get wedge educated, mm. which I always thought was very funny to like go through the question and answer like where you play, what are your conditions like, what is your sand like, and they would give you recommendations. And I think for a lot of people like the OEMs are there. They really do want to educate consumers. And, you know, I could sit on Instagram and try and write three paragraphs, but I really just send people to the websites because they are, there is a great opportunity there uh, to find kind of what they're looking for and to get that information. Now, last question of the evening, you know, we've gone, I don't say, I don't know. We've gone long. We've got kind of gone a normal show today, but uh, got a couple things Two, one quick one. And the next one is like uh, who and what, so do you have a pick for the gold medal? For the women's, do you have someone in mind? You don't have to give me your top three, but like you got one player and why? I mean, you can't not pick Nelly. I mean, she's playing so well. Um, and uh, when they play Solheim Cup, they the girls go, you know, I mean, any Ryder Cup or Solheim Cup, they're just pumped to play it. So I could really see Nelly going going deep today and and you know potentially getting a gold medal. Sorry, Brooke Henderson, but I think. Uh, I think Nelly's got it this week. I uh, I'm thinking NB Park. You know she won it. She won it last time. Uh, the course is playing softer, although I know she does hit longer clubs into the greens uh, because she isn't one of the shorter players on tour. Uh, but I think for her coming back as the defending champion, which is really cool, uh, I think she's got a really good chance. She's been playing well, and with a golf course that is receptive to longer golf clubs, especially for the women at like a lower trajectory, which they come in with a little less spin. I think she's got a great chance to repeat. Uh, fingers crossed. Either way, I think it's going to be a really exciting tournament. But uh, remember, tune into that. I think it's, t- it's Tuesday to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday to Friday. So you can uh, tune into that. Which I'm re- or no, sorry, it started yes started today yesterday. So I guess wait, it's Wednesday. We're a day ahead. My bad. Totally wrong. Never mind. But you you get this is I'm doing the North American schedule. So uh, last but not least, and this is a fun one that I got a question on, uh, and I'm sure you've got a story to tell. Do you have a favorite club? It doesn't have to be one that you have now, obviously. Do you have a favorite club that you've ever had? Do you still have it? Did you get rid of it? And why was it your favorite club? 
you're that's thinking, a, I can see you thinking the gears must be turning. There must be a few. That's a tough one. Actually, I was thinking about this the other day because I'm still struggling with a three wood. Um, I had an XR16 Pro 16 degree three wood with an Atmos Blue 7S. And uh, I was walking down the fairway the other day and I was like, I think I've, I think I've given it to my neighbor and I potentially might need to ask him to borrow it um, <laughs> because it just, the three wood, it just took off um, for me. New, new favorite club is probably going to be this Mizuno five wood. I'm not going to lie. This thing is, uh, is legitimately my favorite club in the bag right now. It's uh, so easy to hit and it's a perfect number for me around the club. I know you mentioned it on the, you did a what's in the bag on the TXG mm-hmm. uh, YouTube channel. You can check that out. You can basically go through your entire bag. I thought you were going to say the putter, Mike. I know you people can check that out, what it is. Yeah. Uh, I know it's a really cool one. I know you got some stories to tell with some other stuff coming out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I know I, again, I was, I was expecting the putter, but I can, I can certainly understand why you yeah. like, a, why you like your five wood or uh, that four wood. I actually think, I feel like I got one of those around here somewhere. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll I let you to- borrow it. I have uh, two XR14 Pros, just heads, literally brand new in head cover, sitting in a box somewhere. You're sick of um, And uh, yeah, I need to, I need to get rid of a lot of equipment. I'm sitting on not as many sets of irons as you, but this year was bad for equipment. I don't know why I have such an issue with equipment this year. Oh, well. got a lot of testing, right? Yeah, I guess. I for me. See, I, I know I have like the modern one and then the like the new one kind of thing. Um, this is not the this is not the official favorite, by the way. But one of the drivers I always loved was the 983E. I played that like eight years after it came out. I found one for like next to nothing with like a pro light in it. And I I played people are like what driver's that? I mean, it's a really old title. List of this. this is like 460 cc drivers were out everything. And I went back to this little thing that I got for like 40 bucks. And it was this I it was a pea shooter that I just hit so good. Um but one of my favorites, I'll always remember this golf club. Um, and I got, I got lots of putter stories, but I'll stick to like a club that I take full swings with was I had a steelhead plus, which was the old blue, blue headed Callaway fairy woods. It was a five wood. It was just like a stock Memphis 10 shaft. I don't even know. I think it might've even had the stock grip on it still. Like that was, I had it when I was a kid. And the reason I loved it so much was a, I hit it out of the rough a lot because I was again, I'm not, I was never a strong kid. So it was a great club to hit out of the rough, but it was the first club that ever helped me get an Eagle. Mm. And it was like one of my first times, I think it was the, like literally one of the first times I ever made an Eagle was in like this little money game where like you, it was like, they did a couple times a year on like a long weekend. You got in for like 10 or 20 bucks, whatever it was. And it was, there were skins. And I was someone who didn't make a lot of birdies or Eagles. Like I was a, I don't know, 10 handicap or something. And it was a par five and it's a short par five. It was a very short par five. It's like 450 yards. So like take it for what it is, but I hit five wood off the tee. Cause it was like a safe play. I was like really in my head. Like I want to play good today, hit the five wood off the tee, hit the five wood. And I, it, I can remember the shot literally up in the air. And I'm like, that's going to go in the hole. And it landed like a foot from the hole and bounced over it. And I had like an 18 inch putt for an Eagle. And I, and I made it and I, it was like two shots at this little five wood. And all I could think of was I never, first of all, I'm never going to wear this golf, club, which of course I did. Uh, but it made me, I think it made me like 200 bucks. So uh, it was, I got it used probably for like 50, but I'll always remember that club. Cause it, it there's something about those old Cali fairy woods. And I know they do not hold up now at all to the news, like any new fairy woods, as far yeah. as forgiveness or anything like that. But if you find one in a used bin with an old Memphis 10 shaft in it and it's not rusty or something like that, I always encourage people to go try those things because those were like the modern day, super forgiving fairy woods, which were just were a lot of fun. And I, I always remember that club looking down at that little blue head. I think at one point it even had a dent, like a tiny little dent in the crown. Because again, I bought a used, probably someone who didn't have a head cover on it, just threw it in their bag. And uh, yeah, I'll always remember that golf. It was one of my absolute favorites. So uh, Mike. Great show today. I know, uh, I felt like, I, I feel like I ranted a lot. I know and I try not to, you were very motivational at certain points. So that was a, we had a good conversation. Uh, for those, remember we do the question and answer on Instagram. I am RDS Brath. Mike. Mike TXG. Uh, we do those, try and do them once a week. We, we bring the questions to the show here where we can really kind of expand on uh, what we're doing as far as having that conversation, because on Instagram, we are fairly limited. Uh, pay attention to, to the TXG, uh, Instagram, 
we're going to be doing some more reels. I think it's, it's fun because it can be really informative, really quick, and help answer a lot of the questions that we get here as well to a larger audience, which I think is really important. And, you know, our goal is to educate. Our goal at TXG beyond, you know, getting you fit for golf clubs at one of our studios is to educate you as the golfer. And that's what we're here to do. So if you got questions, ask away. Mike, this, always a pleasure uh, to talk. Is this episode 10? I think I have to check. It could be. I actually, you know what the funny thing is? I never keep track of this stuff. I'd have to go back and check the old thing. Are we at 10 now? I think this might be 10, but regardless to anyone who's listening, if this is episode 10 or when episode 10 comes out, there will be a giveaway. We will think of something. When this goes live, share it on your IG. We'll pick a winner. We'll give you something. Don't know what it is. Shaft, head cover, towel, maybe all three. Who knows? We'll figure <laughs> it out, but spice it up. Give something away. Yeah, so you made it to this point. Look at that. We, we teased the, the listeners for that. And uh, again, thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, have a good week. Adios. Adios.